Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is the second of two RPGs in a six-game RPG series. Like most turn-based RPGs, you collect two things after almost every battle, experience points and money. Experience points, called star points in this game, are used to level Mario up and improve his abilities, and money is used to buy things like items, badges, and healing from inns and recover blocks. These are both important parts of how you progress through the game, so what happens if you completely ignore one of them? In this video, I'm going to find out and try beating Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door without ever using money. Before we get into things, let me lay out the rules I set up for this playthrough. The goal is to complete the game without ever losing coins for any reason. The most obvious impact of this rule is that I can't buy things, but it also applies to situations that you might not think of right away. For example, if you flee a regular battle, Mario drops coins and that's not allowed. I can pick them back up, but the goal is to never lose the coins in the first place. Also, certain enemies can steal coins in battle and that's not allowed either. If I ever lose coins, I have to restart and load my last save. The playthrough will be a success if I beat the game without losing coins. But that brings me to rule number two. In some games, there are points where you have to use money to proceed. In the Kanto Pokemon games, for example, you have no choice but to pay the entry fee to get into the Safari Zone since you need the key items that are inside. Since moments like these are completely mandatory, they're allowed. The idea is to add a self-imposed challenge to the playthrough to make the gameplay more unique, so story moments are excluded. It'd be like ending a hoverless playthrough of Mario Sunshine because Mario hovers in the tutorial video you have to watch. If I manage to complete the game, at the end of the video I'll tell you how much money is absolutely required by the story. And the last rule is, no using glitches to skip things. With that out of the way, let's get started. The start of the game is simple enough. After having Luigi read his mail to him, Mario gets a map from Peach and heads off to Rogueport. After arriving, I had my first battle against Lord Crump. The game doesn't teach you about guarding until a little later on, but you can still do it, so I did since I definitely wanted to save my HP as much as I could, since inns and recover blocks aren't allowed. There are two types of guards in this game, and the first is a regular guard. By pressing the A button right as an attack is about to hit you, you guard and decrease the damage you take. The second type is a super guard. If you press the B button instead of the A button, you completely negate all damage, and if the enemy is doing a physical attack, you also do a counter attack that deals one damage. The fact that it negates damage completely is obviously very valuable, but the risk is that the timing is a lot more strict for super guards than it is for regular guards, and if you mistime either type of guard, you end up taking the full damage. I definitely wanted to try for super guards when it wasn't too risky, so I could try and save HP. After the battle, Goombella joined me, and I headed east for Professor Frankly's house to see if he could tell us anything about the Treasure Mario's map like. So it hadn't even been 5 minutes yet, and already my coin total had gone down. I knew this was coming, but unfortunately there wasn't anything I could do about it. The only way to prevent him from taking coins is if you don't have any, which can only happen if you spend them before heading to the east side of town. So either way, you're losing coins. You can go find him and get your coins back, but since my rules said that fleeing and picking the coins back up isn't allowed, this counts as one of the forced coin uses. So that was a pretty rough start, but thankfully the next time the game forces you to use coins isn't for quite a while. After I met Frankly, he opened the way to the sewers. Before I followed him though, I decided to fight Gus. He blocks the way to the easternmost side of East Rogueport and only lets you pass if you pay him, which I obviously couldn't do. But you can also fight him and if you win, he leaves the area permanently and you can get through for free. I didn't need to get over to that area yet, but I eventually would, so I thought I'd challenge myself and try to beat him right then to get it over with. He has a spear, so I couldn't jump on him. That meant all Goombella could do was defend every turn while Mario attacked with his hammer. I did pretty good with Super Guards, but I still ended the battle with both Mario and Goombella under 5 HP, which gives them an icon saying they're in danger during battles. But I got 22 star points for winning, which is a lot for this point in the game, so it wasn't so bad. After some simple battles and a trip to the Thousand Year Door, Mario learned the special ability Sweet Treat, which lets you heal HP and FP, this game is equivalent to magic points, without using items. Using special moves like this one costs star power, so for most of the playthrough I saved my star power so I could use Sweet Treat to heal without using my items, which are obviously a much more precious commodity under these rules. As you might imagine, a lot of the difficulty in this challenge doesn't come from the boss fights themselves, since I'm still allowed to level up and fight like normal. A lot of it comes from the fact that I'm not allowed to prepare myself for them in the normal way, which means I constantly have to be looking for ways to get items and heal myself, or try my luck against bosses with a team I couldn't heal. My next destination was Petal Meadows, where the first Crystal Star was, but first I had to face the game's first real boss, Blooper. I'd gotten healed for free earlier from one of the tutorials, so I was in fine shape entering this battle. I did take a bit of damage, but the fight wasn't too hard overall, and I defeated him. With the Blooper gone, the way to Petal Meadows opened, and I headed there to start Chapter 1. In Petal Meadows, I started by heading east towards town. Something I should point out is that whenever you level up, you get fully healed. 
Despite that, I decided that I wanted to fight most of the enemies I came across for the time being, since heals wouldn't mean much if I barely had anything to heal. Getting stronger was the more important part of the level ups, and timing level ups to use them as heals would probably be pretty hard anyway. A little further east and I reached Petalburg, and I headed to Schwank Fortress from there. Traveling through Schwank Fortress is a little interesting. A few different buildings are separated by outdoor sections, and in each outdoor section you can find an attack item that will instantly defeat the enemies in the next building. As I made my way through the buildings, I also picked up an inn coupon. Inn coupons give you one free heal and an inn. There are only seven of these in the entire game, so I held on to the ones I found until I really needed to use them. After making it to the easternmost building and winning a quiz show, I headed underground. With good timing on my guards, I made it through without taking much damage. After grabbing what I came for and finding an easy mini-boss, I headed for Hooktail Castle along with a new partner, Coops. Inside the castle, I picked up the Power Bounce badge. This is one of the best badges in the game. It lets you continue jumping on an enemy until you mess up the timing. Every consecutive jump deals one less damage, down to a minimum of one. So if your first jump does three, your second will do two, and then the third and fourth will do one damage each, and already you've done seven damage in one attack. So with good timing, you can defeat enemies in one go. The game actually secretly puts a cap on how many times you can do a single power bounce against bosses, because that's how powerful it is. This badge is good for this challenge, since it makes it easier to quickly power through boss fights before they can whittle down my HP. There isn't too much to say about the castle itself. The enemies weren't very hard, and after some puzzle solving and very intense, very difficult escape sequences, I made my way up to the top of the castle. I got pretty lucky here. With the battles I'd done in the castle, I had just enough star points to the very last enemy before the chapter boss leveled me up, completely healing me for the boss fight. I'd also picked up some items along the way, like a life shroom which automatically revives a character when they get defeated, along with a number of HP and FP healing items. And I hadn't even used any healing items yet either, so I was feeling pretty good going into the Hooktail fight. Hooktail is the first chapter boss, but the battle actually wasn't very difficult. I was saving my FP for power bounds in case I got into a dangerous position and wanted to try firing off a last resort attack, but the fight was actually easy enough that I defeated her without using power bounds or items at all. With Hooktail defeated, I grabbed the first crystal star and the chapter was over. One of these, one of those, and I made my way back to Roadport. While in town, I also used the shine sprites I collected to upgrade Gumbella. Upgrading your partners increases their maximum HP and gives them a new ability. In this case, Gumbella learned Multibonk, which works exactly like Mario's power bounce, making it an extremely helpful upgrade. After that, I headed to Bogley Woods, where the second crystal star was. The enemies in this area were a step up from chapter 1, and they did more damage. One particular enemy worth pointing out are the Clefts. I fought some of these in Schwank Fortress back in Chapter 1, but I got free POW blocks to defeat them instantly. Here I had to defeat them in regular battles. The problem is that their defense is higher than other enemies, and my attacks dealt no damage. And of course I couldn't flee since Mario drops coins when he does. I could have defeated them using the Earth Tremor special ability or using items, but that seemed like a waste to me, so I ended up defeating the clefts using Super Guards exclusively. They've only got 2 HP each, so 2 Super Guards and they're done. To get into the tree where the crystal star was, I needed a new party member, but she wouldn't leave her house without her missing necklace. To get it for her, I had to do the first boss fight of the chapter. Unfortunately, I had been a bit bold with trying to super guard against the enemies beside the clefts, and I also fell down a hole by mistake, so by the time I had to fight the shadow sirens, Mario only had 2 HP left. I couldn't access an inn in this area yet, I couldn't use the recover blocks, and the shadow sirens fight happens automatically when you head back to the western side of the woods, meaning I couldn't go back to Roadport and use an inn coupon to heal there either. I was trapped in the woods at 2 HP with no way to fully heal. I gave the fight a try once and died on the first turn. Mario used the life stream and came back, but I didn't want to waste that, so I restarted and considered my options a little more. The Shadow Sirens use spells that hit everyone, and they're pretty tricky to guard against, so I definitely wanted to heal up. And although it might sound counterintuitive, what I ended up doing was fighting enemies until I leveled up. I did this for two reasons. First, I wanted the free heal, of course, but I also wanted to upgrade my FP to 10. Now that Gobella was upgraded, she could use Multibonk. Multibonk and Mario's Power Bounce both cost 3 FP to use, and you can do a lot of damage with each of them. Since the Shadow Sirens are tough, I wanted to rush in and take one of them out really quickly to make the fight more manageable. With 5 FP, I could only do one Power Bounce or Multibonk, but with 10 FP, I could do three of them. I ended up using my very first healing item of the playthrough, a Mushroom, to make sure I could survive the training session. After leveling up and upgrading my FP, I tried the Shadow Sirens fight again. This time it went a lot better. I defeated Marilyn on turn 1, Beldum on turn 2, and then Vivian on her own wasn't a problem and I won the battle on turn 4. After getting Flurry to join my party, I entered the Great Tree. The main gimmick of the chapter is that a big group of these little creatures follow you around, and you need them to make progress. But they scatter whenever enemies approach you, which basically meant I had to take out every enemy I came across. It turned the whole chapter into an interesting test of endurance. While in the tree, I picked up a badge called Charge. I point this out because it's one of my favorites, and lets me unlock Power Bounce's full potential. Equipping this badge adds the Charge command to Mario's tactics menu in battles, and using the command increases his next attack's power by 2. And it stacks, so if you use Charge two turns in a row, your next attack will now do 4 extra damage. But every jump you do in a single use of Power Bounce counts as one attack. 
So for example, if you've charged up enough that your first jump will do 20 damage, the second jump will still do 19 damage, then 18, 17, 16, and so on. So if you charge for a bunch of turns in a row, you can absolutely destroy bosses by dealing ridiculous damage. In that example I just gave, those 5 jumps would deal 90 damage in one turn. My main boss strategy from this point on was to spend several turns charging up, and then use Power Bounce. The next chapter boss was Magnus Von Grapple, a robot controlled by Lord Crump. This fight was pretty easy and I didn't even end up using the charge strategy I just mentioned. Instead, I used a Power Punch I'd picked up to raise Mario's attack by 2 for a few turns, and then used Power Bounce and multi a few times. By the time Mario's attack went back to normal, Magnus was down to 3 HP. I even managed to get a bingo to completely heal my HP when I got Magnus down to 1 HP. It just wasn't Lord Crump's day at all. After beating him, I grabbed the second Crystal Star and completed the second chapter. One of these and one of those later, and I hit the road and headed on my way. The next Crystal Star was in Glitzville, but first I had to do something unfortunate. Remember how I mentioned in the rules that I'd make an exception for using money when the story absolutely requires it? Well, other than the Bandit in the Prologue, this is the section of the game that came to mind for me when I said that. With the Bandit in the Prologue, I lost 50 coins, but then I got them back. Even though I am counting that as losing money, I at least got them back and my coin total didn't stay down. But for this section, I had to actually spend my money on multiple items in two shops. I even looked up a glitchless speedrun route for the game just to be 100% sure that there was no way around it, and yep, I had to spend the money here. So here's what happened. To get to Glitzville, I had to get a blimp ticket from a syndicate boss on the west side of town. This is still a Mario game, right? Okay, cool. To start, I headed for the west side of the town square. I had been purposely avoiding the west side until this point. A chef named Zest T has been searching for her contact lenses here for two entire chapters now, plus the prologue, but as soon as you approach, you break them and she forces you to buy her new ones. She was clearly doing a very thorough search. I had to buy the lenses at the shop in the square, which cost 10 coins. I brought the contact lenses to Zest T, who headed into her kitchen. Once you give Zest T her contact lenses, you can give her items and she'll cook things for you. But I decided I wouldn't do that. Since I had to pay for the contact lenses that unlock cooking, it didn't really seem fair to use it. So you could consider that an additional challenge I set for myself. Now that I had access to the west side of town, I headed to West Side Goods, the item shop for this area. To get to Don Pianta, you have to buy a dried shroom and a dizzy dial in that order, and then answer some questions. These cost 14 coins for a total of 24 coins spent in this section of the game. And just to be completely fair, I also sold back these items to the shop immediately after I got them. They weren't amazing items or anything, but like with cooking, it wouldn't feel fair to keep items that I had to buy. Also, a fun little side note before I continue. To learn how to get to Don Pianta, you're supposed to pay a guy in the east end of town 64 coins for the info. So if I didn't already know how to do this, this section of the game would have cost me an additional 64 coins. But luckily, I didn't have to, and I was done with money for now. After that, I got my ticket and headed over to Glitzville. Chapter 3 is all about climbing the ranks of a fighting arena called the Glitz Pit because the Champion's Belt has a crystal star on it. You might think that a chapter in a fighting arena would be really difficult without being able to use an inn, but the Glitz Pit is one major twist compared to the locations of previous chapters that actually makes things much easier. Since Mario becomes a fighter, he gets to enter the locker room for his current league. Every locker room has a bed in it that can be used for free. These completely heal HP and FP, but not star power. So even if I took a lot of damage in one of the matches, I got to heal up for free after every single battle. In fact, there actually isn't an inn in Glitzville at all. The only beds are these ones, and they're free. Most of the fights in Glitzville were pretty easy. The biggest thing that happened in the first half of the chapter was that I got my next party member, a baby Yoshi. During this chapter, I found that Flurry's Gale Force ability is actually pretty good against big groups or enemies with high defense. If it succeeds, you can blow enemies out of the battle, defeating them instantly. I'd never really used this in past playthroughs, but it works a lot more consistently than I would have expected. Eventually, I climbed my way up to rank 2. My next opponent was the rank 1 fighter, the Koopanator, who fought on his own without a team. It's kind of strange that the Koopanator was rank 1, yet he was below the champion Rockhawk on the leaderboard, whose rank was marked by the Crystal Star Champion Belt. If he's not first, is he 0th? I don't know. <laughs> the Koopanator fight was really hard. He was able to hit both characters at once, and if I missed the guard, it dealt 5 damage to both of them. But he could also charge up his next attack, which made it deal 10 damage to both characters. On my first attempt, I didn't manage to do much damage at all, and then he defeated me. It was a pretty similar story on my second attempt. I managed to win on my third attempt. I had to use my partners as shields, and I used up a few healing items, but I got it done. Since he had spikes, I couldn't jump on him, so most of my damage came from super-powered hammer attacks after using charge for a few turns. You might think that if the Koopanator was hard, then the champion must have been really hard, but nope. The Rockhawk battle was simple and quick, and with that the champion title was mine. Unfortunately, the Crystal Star in the belt was a fake, so I still had to find the real one. Mario found out that the arena manager Grubba had it, so I chased him to the ring where he used the Crystal Star to power himself up, and the chapter boss fight began. I don't want to make accusations, but I bet he's using steroids. Here's how that went. Yeah, I wiped the floor with him. It was a perfect fight. 
I superguarded every single one of his attacks and then took him out with a charged power bounce. I didn't take any damage at all. The fight gave me enough star points to level up, and I point this out because earlier in the chapter I picked up the Charge P badge, which gives the charge command I've been using with Mario to his partners. For this level up, I upgraded my badge points and equipped it, which meant Goombella can now do the same kind of crazy damage as Mario. With Grubba defeated, I grabbed the third crystal star, and after one of these and one of those, I headed back to Rogueport. The next crystal star was in a place called Twilight Town. Luckily, I didn't need to use money to get there like I did for Glitzville, so I headed over and started Chapter 4. The enemies in this area are pretty powerful, and my HP got knocked down quickly. I tried to avoid enemies as best I could, but some enemies were on narrow paths which made avoiding them tough. Up to this point, I usually liked saving my FP, but the enemies in this area were so tough that I ended up using multibonk with Goombella while Mario appealed to get star power and use Sweet Treat over and over. It actually wasn't a terrible strategy, and it let me stay relatively healed up without wasting my items. In the creepy steeple, I did an optional boss fight against the Atomic Boo. The fight wasn't very difficult, and my usual strategy of charged power bounces and multibonks worked perfectly. I went back to the woods and healed by using appeals and sweet treat in battles against the enemies there, and then came back to the steeple for the next boss. Duplis was up next, and he was even easier than the Atomic Boo. During the battle though, he secretly switches places with Mario, which meant that Mario was the one who actually got defeated. Duplis runs off with Mario's friends, leaving Mario alone without a name and body. Making it back to town was challenging with only one character, but I managed it with 3 HP left. Right outside the town gates, Duplis gives you the chance to guess his name. Unfortunately, I don't know what his name is, so I guess I'm out of luck for now. He fought me after I failed to guess. Neither of us are able to damage each other in this fight though, so I ran away. Remember, running away doesn't make you drop coins unless it's a regular encounter. After picking up the next party member, Vivian, in town, I came up with a strategy I could use. Duplis challenges you every time you try entering or exiting town, but you can't damage each other. That meant I had all the time in the world to appeal and use Sweet Treat to completely heal myself. In other words, I could basically use this fight as an in for now. In this chapter, I started making use of Sweet Treat pretty regularly to keep myself healed up without using items. This is something I did going forward as well. After a bit more back and forth, I faced off against Duplis, and this time it actually was the final fight of the chapter. For this fight, Mario's partners are on Duplis' side as well, but the battle ends as soon as Duplis is defeated, so I focused on him with the same strategy I used the first time and did fine. Mario got his name and body back, and I got the Crystal Star for real this time. That was half of the chapters done. Something happened in the battle that I thought was interesting though. Before the battle, Vivian leaves temporarily, so Mario starts the battle alone. After a few turns, she comes back, but even though I still had the charge badge for partners equipped, Vivian couldn't use it in this battle, presumably because the partner badges weren't active at the start of the battle since I didn't have one with me. I didn't know it worked like that, and I guess this is maybe the only situation where this would happen. The next Crystal Star was on Keel Hall Key, but before I went there, I headed to the Trouble Center. There was an anonymous request I could complete, and by doing so, I was able to add the optional party member Miss Mouse to the group. The main reason I wanted to do this was because she has an ability called Kiss Thief, which lets her steal items and badges from enemies. This meant that if I ever got desperate for items later in the game, I could steal some with her. After maybe the darkest story in any Mario game, a group of us set sail to Keelhaul Key. The sailing went badly, and the group ended up stranded on Keelhaul Key. Papatch falsely claimed that they built a hut I could rest in. What he actually meant was that there's an inn I can pay to stay at, so no rest for us. You can find a Wacka at the entrance of the island. You can whack this thing with your hammer to get a Wacka Bump, a super good healing item that restores 25 HP and 25 FP. But that is messed up, don't do that. I said a friendly hello to Wacka and headed on my way. Like with the transition from chapter 3 to 4, the enemies here were a big step up, and lots of them were hard to dodge too. My HP was taking a big hit with every battle. The enemies weren't just strong, but some of them also dealt status effects like burns and poisoning. I actually ended up using a Super Shroom for safety, despite how much I've been trying to save my items. The Embers were especially tough, and I ended up pulling Flurry back out for some of these battles and using her Gale Force like I did in Chapter 3. I could have used the Ice Power Badge to make Mario safe jumping on the flames, but Flurry seemed like an easier solution. After saving Bobbery from some Embers, I tried heading back to camp and actually got defeated. I'd been defeated a handful of times, but I always had a Life Shroom on me to come back, and sometimes I'd reset the game so I wouldn't waste a Life Shroom. But this was the first time I'd actually gotten a game over. On my second try, I decided to be a lot more aggressive than the first time, burning through FP and star power to win battles. I even used my Ultra Shroom to restore Mario's HP for complete safety. But it worked out and I made it back to camp. After having Bobbery join the party, I headed for the caves at the end of the island. If it wasn't obvious by now, this is where the challenge definitely started to ramp up. Because I couldn't use ends or recover blocks, my HP was constantly low. In these caves, for example, even though the enemies were easier to avoid than the ones outside, when I did get into battles, I took quite a bit of damage and I couldn't run away even if things got dangerous. I had to use items to save myself, and Goombella and Vivian both got knocked down to just 3 HP. I was actually starting to get a bit worried at this point, because I still had a boss to worry about at the end of the caves, but I came up with a strategy. Earlier on, I'd picked up a Heartfinder badge in Rogueport by trading some of the star pieces I'd found. Heartfinder makes enemies drop more hearts after battles, which heal both characters by 1 HP per heart. 
By equipping this, the weak bullet bill enemies who normally drop almost nothing now drop hearts every time they're defeated. So by getting into battles with them over and over, I can heal up the group. With this badge, I can make the weak enemy encounters work for me like Duplis did last chapter. Now that I was getting several hearts after every battle, things became a lot more manageable. Even in areas without bullet bills, I was still keeping myself decently healed, and I could get back to full when I found bullet bills. At the end, I fought Cortez. He did some pretty big damage, but it felt manageable right up until I got a poison mushroom bingo and cut my HP in half. The fight ended that very turn. On my second try, I took a very different approach. I charged up with Mario and Gumbella for a few turns, and then worked on taking Cortez out with only Gumbella while Mario continued to charge. Once I got to the second phase, Mario finished it quickly with his own charged power bounce. In the third and final phase, I used a jam and jelly with Gumbella to restore 50 FP so Mario could keep doing charges and power bounces, and then she got defeated. But instead of switching partners, I kept Mario in alone. This is because this fight is less about massive individual hits, and more about a bunch of small hits. Cortez has four weapons. The first sword can attack twice, and Cortez himself can attack two, so that's six attacks every turn. But again, there are a bunch of small hits. With the Defense Plus badge, a regular guard blocks all of the damage from both swords and the hook. The rapier also drops to one damage. Cortez can still do good damage when he attacks, but the amount of damage Mario takes every turn is small enough that it's not a concern. Plus, whenever his HP did get low, I used Sweet Treat. Since I had no partner, all of the HP healing went to Mario, which meant he got a lot more HP off of one Sweet Treat. It's still a close fight, especially since missing the guard against the hook can poison you, but I did manage to take him out. For getting this crystal star, Mario learned Sweet Feast, which is basically a better version of Sweet Treat that costs more star power to use. The chapter wasn't quite over yet though. There was one more fight I had to do before I could make it back to Roport. Since Gubella was at 0 HP, I swapped to Vivian for this fight. There's a fight against Lord Crump and some Xnauts on a ship. I used my usual strategy. After charging up a bit, Vivian cast a spell that I imagined felt absolutely miserable, Mario crushed Lord Crump with power bounce, and I got his HP down to 0. But once you defeat him once, he heals and you have to keep fighting. The fight was really close. I managed to win, but it ended just like the Cortez fight. My partner was at 0 HP, and Mario scraped by with just 3 HP. But with that win, the chapter was over. Thankfully, every time a this and that intermission happens, the group gets fully healed, so I didn't have to worry about healing up after that. Back in town, the partner upgrade guy told me about a message from the star charts, and while I'm not a superstitious man, I took him at his word and headed all the way back to Hookdale Castle, where I grabbed an up arrow. When I brought it back, it reminded him that he had a better orb in the attic, so he hopped up there and was now able to upgrade my partner's another level. The next crystal star was in Poshley Heights, and I got to ride a fancy train there. After doing all the stuff I had to do to get a ticket and saying a friendly hello to Waka again, I decided to take a detour. I'd been having a lot of close calls, and I knew the game was only going to get harder, so I decided to do some leveling. If you're familiar with this game, you might assume that I'd head to the Twilight Trails to level up. On the Twilight Trails, an enemy called a Maisy Daisy can appear. These are the Paper Mario equivalent to Metal Slimes. They're tough to beat, but if you do, you get a massive amount of star points. So of course you would expect me to head there and fight them for levels, right? Well, no. I decided to use an even easier leveling spot, the Keelhull Key Caves. Amazy Daisies don't spawn in these caves, and nothing here gives anywhere near the amount of star points they do. So why would I do my leveling there? Well, with a bit of setup, it'll make sense. I started by heading to the character named Dazzle. For two star pieces, I can get the Chill Out Badge, which prevents enemies from getting a first strike. Over on Keel Hall Key, I parked Mario in front of some Bill Blasters. These shoot out Bullet Bills infinitely until you defeat them. If I stand away from them and let Bullet Bills hit me, battles will start infinitely, but I won't take any damage from a first strike attack since they can't happen. Bullet Bills only have 2 HP, so by temporarily unequipping some of my badges so that I can equip ones that boost attack, even a jump where I miss the timing will defeat them in one go. So now I just set up a turbo controller to mash the A button, and I've got a setup that will gain levels on its own. It'll mash A repeatedly, which will initiate the attacks and win the battles. Every regular battle in the game gives out one star point minimum, so this setup will slowly build up my star points for me while I go do something else. And once it gains a level, I don't even have to worry about it picking an upgrade automatically, because you have to move the control stick before any of the options become highlighted. So it's a completely risk-free strategy that gains the levels for you. I didn't want to be too overpowered since that would trivialize the whole challenging part of the challenge, but I also wanted a bit of a boost, especially since I had to use some of my good healing items in the last chapter, so I decided to go up by 4 levels, upgrading HP and FP so that they were both a clean 40. I fixed up my badges and headed for the train. Believe it or not, Chapter 6 doesn't actually have very many battles. Most of it is a fun series of little stories on the train as you travel closer to your destination. And whenever there were any battles, Heartfinder kept me in good shape, so Chapter 6 was the easiest chapter in a while. The chapter boss, Smorg, has three arms, and its main body is invincible until the arms are gone. On my first attempt, I forgot that, so I charged up for a few turns with Mario and Gubella, and then did a fantastic zero damage with Gubella's multibunk. Then I basically wasted Mario's amazing damage on one of the weak arms. I kept trying for a few more turns, but I restarted pretty quick after that. For my second attempt, I started by taking out two of the arms with Gubella. Then I waited. There was only one arm left, which wasn't doing nearly enough damage to be a concern. So I had plenty of time to charge with Mario. 
Once I felt like I had done it enough, I took out the last arm with Goombella, and then obliterated the main body's entire HP bar in one go with Mario, which let me skip the stronger second phase that starts when it takes enough damage. I grabbed the Crystal Star in Poshley Heights, and the chapter was over. One of these and one of the... Oh shoot. The next Crystal Star was in Far Outpost, so after grabbing some new badges and shortcuts, I headed to the pipe leading there. In the fields leading to Far Outpost, I gained another level, and with some extra BP, I equipped the Flower Finder badge. This works like Heart Finder, but for flowers, which heal FP instead of HP. Now, after every regular encounter, enemies will drop both hearts and flowers, healing both my HP and FP. That meant that if I ever needed to heal, I had the option of fighting weak enemies to heal both HP and FP, and I could be less conservative with my FP moves. At this point in the game, I also had the option of heading back to Glitzville or the XS Express to use the beds there for free healing, but it's always good to have options, especially for points where I couldn't get back to those areas for a while. To use the town's cannon and reach the Crystal Star, I had to get permission from Gold Bob, a rich Bob Bob in Poshley Heights. He's a recurring character you help several times throughout the game, so he's happy to help, and all you have to do is ask and he- So yeah, you can't use the cannon without giving Gold Bob all the coins you have. You have to tell him you'll give him every coin you have, and then say yes through several prompts. If you say no to any of them, he won't let you use the cannon and you have to try again. The real kicker here is that Gold Bob doesn't actually even want the coins. He only asks you for them to see how committed you are, but still takes them from your inventory for a few seconds as a scare and then gives them back. So this guy is like the thief from the start of the game. You don't actually lose the money, but every coin you have is still leaving your inventory during the cutscene. Not cool. <laughs> After finding another person needed for the cannon and heading back to Far Outpost, Mario blasted to the moon for his weekly trip to outer space. On the moon, I entered the x Not headquarters where Peach was supposed to be. The hallways in here are pretty narrow, so dodging enemies can be tough, but it wasn't too bad. I decided to work through the base while firing off FP moves in battles to get through them faster. My thinking was, if I made it to the end of the base once, all the puzzles would already be complete and all the shortcuts would be active, so I could leave, heal up on the XS Express, and then come back and get through much easier. So I did just that, and made it to the boss almost fully healed. Lord Crump was waiting for me, and he faced me with Magnus Von Grapple version 2. Unfortunately for him, this fight is super easy to exploit. Magnus uses the same corkscrew attack every turn until he starts taking some damage, so all I had to do was spend a few turns charging like normal and then defeat him in one turn, completely avoiding all of his more annoying attacks. And with that, the final crystal star was mine. After one of those, I teleported off the moon and- Oh god. Back in Rogueport, I headed for the Thousand Year Door with the Crystal Stars in hand for the final chapter of the game. The enemies here, you guessed it, were a big step up from the previous chapter. In fact, they were so much of a step up that I actually died just a few rooms in. I probably could have made it further in if I'd been better at guarding, but this is the game's final dungeon, there are several tough bosses down here. I wanted to save my items for those, so I decided to level up some more. So I went back to Keel Hall Key and got up to level 30. I chose level 30 for two reasons. First, I boosted badge points with every single level I got during this training session, so now I had a lot more to work with and could equip some cool stuff. For example, I equipped two power pluses, which increases Mario's attack by two. I equipped a defend plus, which increases his defense by one. I equipped a flower saver, which cuts Mario's FP costs by one. And a few more. So now I was a lot better equipped. The other reason I shot for level 30 specifically is because you get the final stage upgrade at level 30. This meant that the audience now had a cap of 200 members instead of 150, and that meant that appeals and stylish moves would earn more star power than before, letting me use Sweet Feast and other special moves more often. Also, the final dungeon is long, and there aren't any inns down there where I could use coupons to heal. There are recover blocks, but obviously there was no way for me to use those. So the only way for me to heal without wasting items was to use Sweet Treat and Sweet Feast, or make the long trip back to the surface to heal on the XS Express. My hope was that at level 30, my team would be durable enough to avoid any tight situations like that. And ideally, level 30 would be okay to get me through the entire rest of the game. I mean, surely level 30 will be fine for everything, right? When I entered the dungeon again, things went a lot more smoothly, and I made it down to the Palace Garden, as Goombella calls it. After some riddles and battle-free adventuring, I headed east and fought Gloomtail, the older brother of Hooktail from Chapter 1. He hits really hard, but I was able to take him out with the normal strategy before he could get my HP all the way to zero. After opening the final section of the dungeon and healing up off an enemy using Sweet Feast a few times, it was time for a fight against the Shadow Sirens, who recruited Dupless in Vivian's absence. I defeated Beldum first. I tried really hard to save my star power at first, and I even let Goombella drop to 2 HP before I realized that with the amount of star points Beldum had already dropped, the other two would give me enough to level up for sure. So I started using Sweet Feast to heal and won the battle, with the level up refilling my HP, FP, and star power to full. 
Heart Finder and Flower Finder kept me healed up through the final section of the dungeon, and pretty soon I made it to Grotus. Grotus starts the battle with four Grotus X's around him, and they come back during Grotus's turn. When he has four with him, Grotus has a force field that negates damage to him, but if even one is defeated, the force field disappears. His defense is raised by one for every Grotus X around him, but with enough charges, a bit of extra defense doesn't matter. On my first attempt, I used Goombella to take out a Grotus X each turn while Mario charged. The plan was to do this for a few turns, and then destroy Grotus with Mario a few turns in. But I burned through life streams pretty quickly, so I decided to restart and use a different strategy. On my second attempt, I used Mario as the support character while Goombella charged. This was because Mario's special moves gave him more options than Goombella had. He can defeat all the Grotus X's at once with moves like Art Attack or Earth Tremor, and can heal without using items with Sweet Treat and Sweet Feast. The plan was to charge with Goombella for a few turns while Mario kept them both alive, and then defeat every Grotus X at once with Mario and destroy Grotus with Goombella's multibonk. The plan didn't really work out, but after changing strategies on the fly for a while, I eventually brought out Flurry and used Gale Force to get rid of every Grotus X at once. I did that for a few turns and got Grotus's HP down really low. It would have only taken one more power bounce with Mario to defeat Grotus, but I actually restarted again. It took me a lot of life streams to get to that point, but now that I'd realized Gale Force could defeat the Grotus X's so easily, I wanted to get through the fight using less of my life streams so that I could save them for the final boss. On my third attempt, I entered the battle with Flurry. I put her in front. I used Gale Force first turn to get rid of all four Grotus X's, then defended on the second turn since there were only two of them, and then used Gale Force again on the third turn since there were four again. Meanwhile, Mario charged every turn. Rinse and repeat a few times, and I got rid of every Grotus X and then defeated Grotus in one turn. I didn't even use a single item or special move this time. And that was a really good thing, because I immediately had to fight Bowser and Kami Koopa. This fight wasn't as bad as Grotus, but it was still challenging. My strategy started like usual. I switched to Goombella, then charged with Mario and Goombella to do some major damage with Power Bounce and Multi Bonk. I took out Kami Koopa, but Bowser was doing some huge damage and hit Goombella with a move that prevented her from using any moves for a few turns. She got defeated and used up a life stream, but still couldn't use her moves yet, so I decided to switch to Vivian and use her instead. Mario got hit by the same attack a little later and couldn't jump for a few turns, so I basically just used Hammer Attacks and Vivian's Shade Fist over and over until it was done. It was pretty tight, but I did manage to win. I also used one life stream, but I didn't mind since using one life stream across two entire battles was a lot better than the three in one I'd done in my first attempt. I still had two for the final boss. My HP, FP, and star power were all drained, and I couldn't use the recover block they expect you to use after those battles, so I went back to the previous room. The enemies here didn't give me enough star points to try going for a level up, so I ended up spending about 10 minutes in a battle against the Phantom Ember. I switched to Goombella, used Sweet Feast, and then appealed over and over until I could use Sweet Feast again, and repeated until Goombella was at full HP. Then I switched to Flurry and did the same. With my team healed back up, I headed for the final boss. In the staircase, I said goodbye to the final recover block. Just one fight left. I also grabbed an Ultra Shroom and a Jam and Jelly from the chests here. Then I saved up and headed in for the final battle. My opponent was the Shadow Queen. The first phase of the fight wasn't too difficult. She hits hard, but not so hard that it's unmanageable. I kept swapping between partners while charging to try and avoid using Life Shrooms, but Vivian ended up using one. I knew that I would get healed for the second phase of the fight, so I wasn't worried about my HP, FP, or star power at all, but I wanted to save my items as best I could. I charged up with Mario for quite a few turns while also using charge attacks from my partners, and ended up dealing over 100 damage in a single power bounce. Towards the end of the first phase, I brought Goombella back out so I'd have her at the start of the second phase, but she was low on HP and got defeated, which ended up costing me my final life shroom. I had to be careful in the second phase. After receiving the good wishes from friends across the land, the group is healed and the Shadow Queen is weakened, which starts the second phase. I opened by using charge with both Mario and Goombella, but I decided to have Goombella start using Rallywink instead. Rallywink lets Mario move twice in one turn, which meant he could do two charges per turn. Goombella had less HP and defense than Mario, and the Shadow Queen hit like a truck, so I thought it was best to play it safe and put all my attack boosts onto Mario in case Goombella got defeated. And after quite a few turns of Goombella healing and using Rallywink while Mario charged, I used Power Bounce and went in for the kill. And just like that, it was finished. I beat Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door without using any money. Well, besides when I absolutely had to at least. Mario can leave Rogueport in the surrounding area with his head held high, knowing he did absolutely nothing for their economy. Yep, the adventure is over. Excluding the mandatory purchases, you can indeed beat the game without spending money. But am I missing something? Oh, that's right. I can head back to the Glitz Pit and make a comeback. Unfortunately, Mario's records were deleted from the system, so he has to climb his way back to the top from the bottom again. Yeah, I guess I could do that. But that's it, right? Is there anything else I could try? Ooh. So yeah, I think the obvious final test is definitely the Pit of 100 Trials. For those of you who haven't played this game, the Pit of 100 Trials is a dungeon made by the Shadow Queen. 
Back in the day, she threw people she disliked in there and put them at the mercy of the monsters inside. Yep, this is still a Mario game. As the name suggests, it has 100 floors and I have to defeat enemies in almost all of them. Every 10th floor has a treasure chest and no enemies, and sometimes there will be a freebie floor where a guy will let you skip floors if you pay him. I can't do that, but I still get an enemy free floor if he shows up. But basically, you've got more than 90 floors of increasingly difficult battles to get through. You only get a chance to leave every 10 floors, and there's no place to heal or save. If you die, you lose all your progress. And you have to make it through all 100 floors in one go if you want to get to the bottom. If you leave, you start from floor 1 when you come back. If you look up the Pit of 100 Trials online, you can find people screaming in fear about how difficult it is and how much preparation you have to do. There are even two completely different massive guides explaining how to get through the pit with all kinds of setups and equips laid out. Obviously, I didn't have the option to go buy items to prepare. But, spoiler alert, it's actually not so bad. Enemies in the Pit of 100 Trials are grouped together in sets of 10 floors. So floors 1 to 10 have the same pool of possible enemies, floors 11 to 20 have the same pool, and so on. Each enemy in a given pool is pretty similar in difficulty, so if the first floor in a set of 10 is easy, then you know you're probably set for the coming 10 floors. The first 60 floors were super easy. Heartfinder and Flowerfinder got me to floor 10 and 20 completely healed up, and I made it to floor 60 still mostly healed. Floor 61 onwards was where the difficulty started to ramp up. Every set of 10 floors got harder and harder, and I started using Appeals and Sweet Feast to keep myself healed up. I even decided to do the strategy of leaving one enemy left in a battle, and then getting fully healed in that battle. From floor 91 to 99, the enemies have really high defense. I decided to bring out Flurry and use Gale Force, and that worked really well. To my surprise, these floors were actually not that bad thanks to Flurry. The enemies were far and away the toughest yet, but Gale Force kept killing most of them instantly. On floor 99, I used an Ultra Shroom and a Jam and Jelly just before the final battle to make sure I was fully healed for the fight. The real final battle of the challenge was against Bone Tail on floor 100. I used my usual boss strategy against Bone Tail. I charged with Mario and Goombella for a few turns, then used Power Bounce and Multi Bonk when I was ready. When Goombella got low on HP, I used her Multi Bonk and it took out a major chunk of Bone Tail's HP. Mario had his attack lowered and then got dizzy, so I kept charging with him until those status effects went away. Once they did, I had Goombella use a Power Punch I had picked up in the pit on Mario, and then used Power Bounce and dealt over 100 damage. With less than 20 HP left on Bone Tail, it only took two more turns to take him down. And with that, the pit was complete. Because this was the real final battle, I knew I didn't need to save my items anymore, so I used them when I needed to. Because of that, even though Bone Tail was able to deal big damage, I got through the battle easily enough. I grabbed my prize, said goodbye, and headed back for the surface. And that's it, for real this time. I completed the final boss and the Pit of 100 Trials without ever touching my wallet when I had the choice. <laughs> Let's take a look at all of the mandatory spending and see how much money you absolutely need to complete the game. In the prologue, a bandit steals 50 coins from you. It can be less than that, but he always takes half of what you have, so you'd have to spend money anyway. So I'll just mark this down as 50. You can find him and recover these coins, so that's 50 recoverable coins. You also have to spend 10 coins on Zesty's contact lenses, and 14 coins on the items in Westside Goods that let you meet Don Pianta. You spend these coins and don't get them back, so that's 24 coins you can't recover. Finally, in Chapter 7, Gold Bob takes all of your money for a brief moment before giving it back. If you haven't used any money, then you'll probably be at around the max at this point like I was, so I'll mark this down as 999 recoverable coins. In total, that means you use 24 coins you can't get back, at around 1,029 coins that you can get back for a total of around 1,073 coins used over the playthrough. Maybe a little lower depending on how much you have when you meet with Gold Bob in Chapter 7. So there we have it. I even made it through without using a single in coupon. If you're a fan of the Thousand Year Door, I would highly recommend giving this challenge a try. I didn't really know how much of a difference it would make at first, but that one rule change made me change my entire approach for the whole game. I had to be resourceful and constantly look for opportunities to save items and heal with special moves in battle. Never knowing when you'll be able to fully heal next is pretty exciting. Either way, I hope you enjoyed, and thank you for watching.